uh, we, you just heard from the greatest scholars in America about the 14th Amendment, and you are now about to hear from three of the most thoughtful and distinguished judges in America. <clears throat> this is an amazing group. They are all serving on the second founding uh, advisory board, and they are three uh, extraordinary uh, federal appellate judges. You're going to meet Judge Janice Rogers Brown of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge Bernice Donald of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and Chief Judge Theodore McKee of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, right across the street from the National Constitution Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Judges Rogers Brown, Donald, and McKee. Really wonderful to see you. It's so glad you're here. Welcome. Great to see you, Ted. Please. I am so glad to welcome you all back to the National Constitution Center. And the last time I saw much of this group at this amazing conference that the Federal Judicial Center, which is the education arm of the federal judiciary, put on here at the Constitution Center in the fall. And Judge Je Rogers Brown gave a public uh, presentation about the 14th Amendment. And then the judges met in private session to talk about their experiences with issues of race in the courtroom and uh, applying the 14th Amendment. And it was off the record, so we're not going to talk about the substance, except I think I can say that it was one of the most emotional and memorable discussions among judges I've ever seen, because people were talking about their personal experiences and how it related to their role as judges, and it was really electric. So I, I am just going to begin, Judge Donald. You spoke so movingly uh, in that session, and you also have had some very memorable personal experiences witnessing family and friends take place in civil rights campaigns. You were one of only four African-American students in your high school class. Tell us about how those experiences as a child with discrimination influenced your view of the 14th Amendment today. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Let me say, first of all, how honored I am to be here and taking a part in this forum. Uh, it, it, listening to the first panel and talking mm. about the history of the laws is really quite moving. Uh, and as I sat and listened, and your question reminds me, and should remind all of us, that we can have great laws, eloquent laws, laws that extol equality, but laws are not self-executing. It comes down to men and women making real and applying those laws. The first of the Brown cases, I believe, was filed in 1951. It was filed in a district court at a time when I was unborn. The Brown 54 case was decided when I was three years old. And when I began school in 1957, I began school in a two-room cinder block school with no running water, no indoor facilities, with grades one and two in one room and grade three in the other with the other African-American kids going to school in a one-room black church. Their classrooms were uh, arranged according to pews in the church. The older kids would bring us water down in 10-gallon pails so that the younger kids would have water to drink. And this is post-Brown. And even though the law of the land said that separate but equal is inherently unequal, inequality was uh, a reality uh, in, my, in my life. In 1959, Mississippi, Soda County, built for the blacks a Plessy-compliant school. They built a new school for the black kids so that we would not uh, have to be admitted to uh, the white school, disregarding the law. But in 1966, uh, Mississippi got the word from the federal government that they were not going to get any more education funding if they did not desegregate those facilities. And they said, okay, okay, we'll do it, but we can't do it all at once. We'll take the little kids first, and then we'll take the older grades. And so in 1967, for the first time, black kids were allowed to go to the white school. And it was a hostile environment, and I, along with three other African-American women, went to the white school. I will tell you that it was amazingly hostile because we were not welcome. Even though the law said we should be there, the environment was not welcoming. And so we were in a school 
physically there and present, but still segregated in our interactions and with teacher involvement. Uh, so that time for me was very difficult, and I will say two other things and then I'll stop talking. In 1967, when I went there, uh, along with those three other women, we actually faced uh, physical hostility at times because we people wanted us to go back to our schools. And the teachers were not, um, well, apparently were told not to give any of the African American students any information about college or provide no counseling services. And so when I graduated as an honor student in 1969, even though I earned college scholarships, my counselor told me more than a decade later how much she regretted the fact that she could not communicate that information to me. So even though I had earned that, I had to find a way to get myself to college and pay for it, notwithstanding what happened then. And so when people talk about the distance we've come, yes, we've come a great distance. But notwithstanding the law of the land, we still found those practices of inequality and overt discrimination and overt exclusion in my lifetime. Uh, I am hopeful that we will come to a day when we really can look at all people as equal and, and deal with each other uh, on a person-to-person -person level. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. And while the situation that I encountered is, is perhaps different now, we are now in schools more segregated, at least in the high school and elementary schools, than we were in 67 when I went to that school. Remarkable. Um, Judge Rogers Brown, uh, Judge Donald, like the previous panelists, have talked about the struggles of the, to fulfill the promise of the amendment to achieve racial equality. But the amendment was also intended to achieve economic liberty and economic equality. And you have spoken very powerfully here at the Constitution Center and elsewhere about how that promise of basic economic liberties was a boon to uh, African Americans. Um, and the court initially enforced it, it came, but it's, in your view has come to do less so today. Is the promise of economic liberty a, a more positive uh, story of the 14th Amendment? And tell us how you think it is important to guaranteeing civil equality today. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> a small question, but you've, you've been yeah. very powerful about this, and I want to hear your thoughts. Well, it's, it was really fascinating uh, to hear that story, because I, um, um, I'm a little older. I, I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> I'm a little older than she is, and so I, I do remember um, uh, the, the same sorts of things that when Brown v. the board was decided and so forth. Um, and I guess, you know, kind of following along with that, um, we did, did have a, I guess, Plessy compliant school. Uh, I was born in Alabama. Uh, and in Alabama, I went to uh, a school called the Crenshaw County Training School which was the, the segregated school for black students at that time. When I tell people that, they often say to me, were you in reform school? <laughs> you know? I mean, it sounds kind of odd, uh, but that was their way of saying that we could be trained, but not educated. Uh, but so that re, you know, makes me think about all of the things, um, all of the ways in which uh, we have tried to figure out what's necessary um, to solve the problem uh, of you know, having had slavery in, in this country. At the time of the 14th Amendment, um, there was concern about economics, not necessarily the idea of economic liberty as we sort of think about it now, but the fact that the, the, you know, we were, we've been talking about the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment and why that needed to be done. And one of the problems, uh, one of the ways that the Republicans at that time thought about this problem and that Lincoln thought about this problem was the right of a man, a human being, to own himself. In other words, uh, this was the principle that slavery violated. Uh, what they were saying is it cannot possibly be the case that it is okay 
to take away from somebody their right to own themselves, their labor, the work of their hands. And so for them, uh, in part, that was what freedom meant. And so the 13th Amendment, which just said slavery is abolished, uh, was to some people a way of saying, well, that takes care of that. People now own themselves. They have the right to contract. They said what those uh, rights of citizenship were then. So right, to, to, go, to make contracts, to uh, own your own property, to do as you wanted to do. Now, a lot of other things they left out of that because they considered them not to be civil rights, but political rights or social rights. So they distinguished that. They had a very clear line on um, economic rights. And so that was one of the things that they included, I think, in privileges and immunities. As you've heard, you know, a lot of that fell by the wayside. Um, but that idea of you know, free soil, they said, uh, free men, free labor, that was kind of uh, the way that they thought about it. That really is a legacy um, from the 14th Amendment. Now, you've probably also heard uh, that there is a big uh, controversy uh, which continues about whether or not those kinds of rights are significant. And there is a period in our uh, jurisprudence where we kind of separate uh, the idea of civil rights and even political rights from economic rights. So I think that's what <laughs> Uh, what, what Jeff is, is talking about is that after Caroline Products, the court sort of said, well, you know, there are some really important rights, uh, sort of what's in the Bill of Rights and that sort of thing, but economic rights are sort of, you know, second class rights. We don't worry about them as much. Um, there are all kinds of reasons for that dichotomy. I don't happen to think uh, it's a particularly useful one. I happen to have a lot of sympathy with the idea uh, of the people who were looking right at the beginning and saying, uh, what is really important uh, is to own yourself, to be able to take care of your family, to be able to do uh, what you need to do to earn your living. Um, and so those kinds of rights are very important. The courts now don't view them the same. So. That's beautifully said. And this uh, question is going to be the subject of our seminar for next year. Judge Fogel and I are going to try to bring you all back here to talk about whether this post-New Deal understanding that economic rights should be given lesser protection than civil rights uh, should be reexamined. And I can't wait for that conversation. Uh, Chief Judge McKee, um, both of your colleagues have first of all told a little bit about their personal experiences and their education and how that's influenced their outlook in applying the 14th Amendment. And you in particular have written about the pervasiveness of uh, implicit bias and how the fact that we are all prisoners of our perspectives and experiences and that can affect the way people apply the law in the courtroom. So tell us about your own uh, education and how that led you to your views about implicit well, bias. Well, I was actually thinking about that as, as my colleagues were speaking. I did not grow up in the South. I grew up in a small town outside of Rochester, New York, about as far upstate, uh, far north as you can get. You're going any further north, you're either in Lake Ontario or in Canada. Um, <laughs> in, in my town, uh, there were only, it was a very small town, there were only about four or five black families counting mine. But I had a very similar situation in, in high school. Uh, I wasn't a, 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 a Phi Beta Kappa kind of student in high school, but I did very well. And actually, ironically, later on, I worked in admissions for the State University of New York for three years. And then when, when I was there, I understood how you can package someone's strengths. And when I saw that, I thought, well, damn, I was, I was pretty competitive for college. I was president of the student council. I was a varsity athlete in three sports um, and a solid B student. And I had incredibly strong letters of recommendation. Despite that, when I went into my guidance counselor at the beginning of my senior year, and told her that I wanted to talk to her about uh, going to college, she began to speak to me about two-year schools that I should apply to. And she said, you know, Ted or Teddy, as I was known in my school, <clears throat> I really am not sure that it's realistic for you to think about a four-year school. You maybe should think about enrolling in a, um, a bachelor's program, an associate's program. And I was very handy with my hands. I twirled leather as a kid, uh, starting when I 
I, third or fourth grade, and I had these really nice briefcases, better than anything any of my teachers had. And so she knew I liked to work with my hands, so she suggested that I go into ornamental horticulture. I don't know what the hell that was. Um, <laughs> I went home, I told my dad, and um, this was in uh, upstate New York. It was really cold, I think it was, it's always cold up there. I think it was the end of September, and there was probably frost on the ground, probably 30 degrees. Uh, we didn't have a car, but Dad got on his bicycle, and he rode up to the high school about a mile and a half, and he came back two hours later, and he said, Mrs. Putnam will see you tomorrow morning, first thing. And I said, I had basketball practice first thing in the morning. And my dad, he was the first black person to play high school basketball in the state of Indiana. Dad was driven for athletics. And for me to think that dad was thinking that I should miss basketball practice, this, I mean, this was momentous. So I said, well, Dad, I've got basketball practice. And he said, the hell with basketball practice. You go see Mrs. Putnam. So I thought, this is, I go in to see Mrs. Putnam, and she's got all this stuff laid out on her desk for me. Uh, schools that we couldn't possibly afford to get into Cornell and afford to go to Cornell and Yale and Harvard, totally unrealistic. So I don't know if that was her way of setting me up to fail or what that was about. But on my own, I was able to um, look at schools that financially we could afford, the State University of New York. And I, Went there and was successful. And when I went to law school, I graduated uh, with honors in the top 10 students in my class. And when I was relating the student to somebody who was very close to me, she still is my high school English teacher, two days after graduation, she said, Ted, you should take the program from your graduation and send it to Mrs. Putnam and underline the part where it says your order of the coif, which is kind of the law school equivalent of Phi Beta Kappa. My wife, very similar experience. She went to school in New York City. And by the way, that is to say, I don't think that Mrs. Putnam uh, would identify herself as a racist, and she would probably thought she was trying to help me out by getting into a good two-year program where I could succeed. Uh, it just wasn't part of her reality, her perception of me, that I was wondering they going to go on and be an honor graduate from a law school. She didn't see me that way. Uh, and I think that was the subliminal kind of mind bug that, that Jeff was suggesting in the question. My wife, and it's very much akin to what you're talking about, going to her guidance counselor. She started going to her guidance counselor, she told me, in her junior year of high school, asking for information about colleges. She was also always told, I don't have any information, I don't have any information. And some of you may remember, some of this was during the teacher strike in New York City. So the, the schools were shut down. She was going to Columbus High School at the time. Um, one day she happened to go in and she asked for any information. And there were a group of students meeting in a conference room off to the side and they're all white students. Uh, and the guidance counselor said, well, I'm sorry, I don't have any information. And she turned to leave, and the guidance counselor, and there's a long story, ironic story, serendipitous story that I won't get into here. Uh, the, the guidance counselor who's in there goes, well, wait a minute, that's the guess, exactly the kind of student that I am trying to uh, interest in school. I want to speak to her. So she goes in, she sits down and she meets. The guidance counselor turned out to be from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Uh, Harper College, I guess, as it was then known, which was one of the crown jewels of the SUNY system. She ends up going to SUNY. A few years later, she went on to medical school and uh, ended up on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania uh, Med School. She's now a very, very accomplished uh, internist with a national organization, uh, pretty much in charge of setting patient safety standards in all hospitals, 90% of the hospitals across the United States and, and doing some work internationally. And this is somebody that her guidance counselor could not help her get into college. She wasn't dissuaded the way mine was, but it was the same kind of, of thing. The guidance counselor didn't see her as somebody who was worthy of being um, helped into college. And it's there, and it's an unfortunate fact of life. We see it playing out in very, very many facets. And so you don't have to be a product of a Mississippi or an Alabama educational system. I am a product of a upstate New York educational system. My wife is the product of a New York City educational system. The same kind of, in a very different kind of manifestation. In a way, I think your manifestation was much more destructive than mine because I didn't have the same kind of hostility or violence. As I said, I was the president of my student body. I didn't have the same kind of hostility to deal with on a daily basis. <clears throat> um, and I, thinking back on it, I'm not even sure I was aware of it, what was going on until Dad told me, forget the damn basketball practice, go in and see Mrs. Putnam. And then I said, well, you know, there's something going on here. If Dad wants me to miss basketball practice. Um, but at the time, I, it didn't hit me. So in a way, I had it a lot easier than both of my colleagues did. But the same poison um, was there. And if we have time, I wanted to hit on the privileges and immunities thing, because that is something that goes to the economic uh, benefits of, uh, of what freedom means. 
the, and, and uh, Professor Shaw said it beautifully, that the slavery was not cold in its grave when the um, forces began to be incarnated. There was a case that was touched upon during the prior discussion, uh, two cases, one of the slaughterhouse cases where the privileges and immunities clause of the Fourth Amendment, uh, 14th Amendment was basically read out of the 14th Amendment, it's still being read out of the 14th Amendment, it's pretty much a dead letter, but it basically guaranteed everyone the privileges and immunities of citizenship. There was no meat put on that bone to define what those privileges and immunities were, but I'd submit to you that if we had a viable privileges and immunities jurisprudence today, we would not be as tied to finding remedies through the Commerce Clause as we are now in order for Congress to legislate in an area. It almost has to be something which touches upon uh, interstate commerce, and Congress has the authority to legislate there because of its powers under the Commerce Clause and the Constitution. The Privileges and Immunities Clause does the same thing. I think it's much, much broader, but the Supreme Court read it out of the 14th Amendment in the slaughterhouse cases. And then, and, and I'll just say this one more thing and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, a few years after that, uh, 10 years after that, the civil rights cases that you heard mentioned up, uh, there was an act passed in 1866, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which did attempt to put flesh on the bones of what does citizenship mean. Incredibly comprehensive, and it guaranteed that there'd be no discrimination based upon race in almost every area of life that you can imagine. Contracts, public accommodations, um, public uh, uh, thoroughfares, subway, well, they didn't have subways then, but on the public carriers. Um, it did not touch on intermarriage, but a lot of states were passing uh, statutes then allowing folks to, to intermarry different races. The, uh, there were several cases that were consolidated where, in one case, someone was def uh, refused, the black woman was refused service at a restaurant, another person was refused entrance into a, uh, on an equal footing into a, a, a movie theater, and these cases were all brought together nationally. The plaintiffs were arguing that the, 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 the defense against the statute, because it also imposed criminal penalties, which we don't see now, for denying someone equal protection. The defendants argued that the Civil Rights Act was unconstitutional because it um, interfered with, uh, it, it was beyond the scope of the federal government, that the federal government did not have the authority to legislate and pass legislation in these kinds of personal individual actions where there was no state action involved. Um, and the Supreme Court basically agreed and struck down the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1866, and it wasn't until another 100 years until we got the Civil Rights, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in doing that, they basically wrote out again the Privileges and Immunities Clause. If that clause were there, all of the kinds of things that I mentioned arguably are privileges and immunities of citizenship. Not necessarily because they're defined in the Constitution, but they're not. But if one person who is a citizen can enjoy a benefit, be it an economic or a social or a political right, and another person is denied that benefit based upon a color, you can argue that that latter person is being denied a privilege and immunity of citizenship as defined by someone else who's entitled to enjoy that. And without that, we're then locked into, as I said, the, the Commerce Clause, and I could go on for a while on that, but I really want to stop because I don't want to hog the conversation. Well, you've just raised uh, a question which thrills the heart of any constitutionalist, and I see Judge Ur nodding too, which is the suggestion that the slaughterhouse cases were wrongly decided when they read the Privileges or Immunities Clause out of the Constitution and reduced it to a dead letter. So Judge, I want to ask you to take up um, Chief Judge McKee's uh, suggestion. Imagine the slaughterhouse cases had come out the other way, and we did have a robust Privileges or Immunities Clause. The judge suggested that would have empowered Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act and do all sorts of stuff. Do you think, uh, do you agree? Would it have constrained Congress in other ways, creating economic liberties that might have uh, called into question some federal statutes today? How would the world look different if the Privileges or Immunities Clause were actually enforced? Wow. Well, I wish I had had a chance to really uh, think about this before this moment, but I. <laughs> Law professor's hypothetical, but. Yeah, <laughs> but, but. Uh, I was just nodding my head because I really feel strongly that um, had we not had lost the Privileges and Immunities Clause, um, we would, the trajectory of, the, you know, of, of our um, jurisprudence here, I think would have been so different. Um, because 
of the way uh, that that was just really uh, read out of um, the, the uh, 14th Amendment and because uh, of the emphasis on state action which followed that, we had a very, very different kind of jurisprudence and it meant that um, ultimately we had to, the uh, equal protection and due process had to then carry so much uh, weight. And eventually then, when we got to trying to undo the jury segregation, uh, then the Commerce Clause had to carry all that weight. And it just seems to me that uh, we might have been arguing about completely different things. And we might, in fact, uh, never have had some of the problems uh, that we had later on trying to do this. For one thing, we would have been a hundred years further along. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, it, I, I, I mean, I don't know exactly what that would have looked like, but I feel certain that it would have been quite different. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Judge, judge, please, yeah. Uh, please I, take I up privileges and immunities, and I have another question after. Well, I, I wanted to say a couple of things, and I want to go back. Uh, to some of the things that the first panel mentioned and, and how we got there. You know that, and our audience may know that, uh, after the war um, and after the passage of the 13th Amendment, many of the southern states, and even though Tennessee is sort of a borderline southern state, didn't take well to the presence of all of these newly free people um, and in Memphis, there was a place where they particularly did not take well to that. And so there was, in 1866, just an outright massacre of a number of African Americans in that community because of resentment to, first of all, African American soldiers who were there in their uniforms, this whole new freedom, a belief that people would sort of rise up and um, consider themselves equal to white residents there, that they would challenge the culture. And, and as I said before, there was a, 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 literal, a literal massacre. And eventually, federal troops had to come back in and try to restore order. Congress held hearings. And, and really, they saw at that time, I think the radical Republicans saw that the things that they feared about the uh, newly freed people uh, being denied that status and being treated really in a paternalistic way were a real reality, because it was evidenced right there through those actions. People were at that time uh, denied opportunity to have certain types of, of employment, but yet were penalized when they did not work. They could be arrested. They could, even after um, 1865, they could not go into court and testify about grievances and injuries that they, that they suffered. And so uh, this whole notion of being uh, a citizen but having none of those protections I think the, um, the Congress actually saw that you, you cannot have a situation like this and have it be sustainable or tenable where these people are simply there but have no protections under the law. And so um, I think, as I agree with Judge Brown, that, that had we retained and, and not sort of gutted or written out of the law, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, that we would be further down the road. Uh, but I think that with the 14th Amendment, um, as, you, as the other panel mentioned, it, people were traveling in uncharted territory. They were sort of looking at a situation and trying to solve problems that they uh, could foresee and some that had actually already manifest. And, and so it doesn't come together as a smooth garment necessarily, uh, but it, it, it has been interpreted uh, sometimes in ways that sort of advance the cause and other times in ways that sort of retarded progress. Uh, but you know, we, we will continue to try and, and um, apply it in a way that advances the goals uh, that uh, the law and society really champions. And I want to answer just briefly the first question you asked me, and that is how do you look at the law given a set of experiences that one has, has engaged in? And I have to say that I think anyone who has ever been the victim of or suffered any kind of oppression or discrimination really finds that an intolerable and unjust situation and will work doubly to try to make certain that, uh, that the laws are interpreted, interpreted and applied fairly uh, 
to people regardless of the artificial characteristics of birth, like race and gender and all those things. And I think that's what most judges try to do each and every day when they come to the law. But we do come to it as a sum total of our life's experiences. And all of us see things, as Judge McKee said, through the lens of that experience. But we try to get to the law and apply it uh, in a way that is fair and, and equal uh, to all. I, I'll, I'll ask you this and then the other judges too. You, you also served as a district judge. You were uh, a staff attorney at the Memphis Legal Services and the mm -hmm. Shelby County Public Defender's Office. You say as a judge, you and your colleagues try to be impartial. Are jurors impartial? And do you think that uh, the law is applied in a race neutral way in the courtroom? I think, judge, I think jurors, like judges, try. But I want to go back to the concept that Judge McKee mentioned. All of us have these biases. And many times they're explicit or unconscious. And, and we're all vested with stereotypes and things that we sometimes can't negotiate. So I think people come to it and try. But sometimes it's not, it, it, it doesn't work. And let me give you a quick example, if I may. When I first became a judge in 1982, I was the first African-American woman to become a judge in Tennessee's history. When I opened court the first afternoon, I opened court in an environment where my court had been staffed thusly. I had a, an African-American male prosecutor. I had, sitting below me, two minute clerks, an African-American male and an African-American female. I had ringed around the courtroom four African-American deputies in their uniforms with their weapons strapped to their sides. And the first person to come into my courtroom was a young white male. When he walked in and looked around, his eyes grew as big as half dollar bills. <laughs> and he looked around and saw no one who looked like him. He came to the bench and asked for a continuance. And I granted it. 30 days later, he came back with an African-American defense attorney. <laughs> and, and while he knew nothing about me and I knew nothing about him, he must have felt that there was no way he could get justice in those courts. And so I, I did a personnel shift because I wanted every individual coming in that court to believe that they had a fair shot at, at justice. And even though the people we brought in had nothing to do with the adjudicative function, that diversity created an environment, I think, that, that advanced the goals of justice. And right now, we're in a situation where African Americans across the country have the least confidence in the justice system and its outcomes, followed next by Latinos, Asian Americans, and of course, um, white Americans have the highest level of confidence in the courts. This was true five decades ago when the National Conference of Christians and Jews did the survey. And it's been true five years ago when that survey was done. So yes, I think we all try, but we're still working to get over things that actually serve as barriers to sometimes the fair administration of justice and sometimes the perception of justice. And the perception sometimes is just as important mm -hmm. as the reality. Right. Uh, uh, Chief Judge McKee, uh, as Judge Donald says, confidence in the law among African Americans is at an all-time low, uh, and including African American police officers and others. Um, in, in your experience, are, uh, is the law applied in a, in a fair or a racist way? And, how, and then to pick up on a question here of the, from the questioners, how can judges reduce the influence of their personal biases? I think that as to the latter question, what we first have to do is recognize that we have them. If we don't recognize we have them, it's over from the very, very beginning. And I do think judges, most judges and most jurors try hard to be fair. They really want to do a good job. I was a trial judge for 10 years before I went into the federal appellate court, and I went into the trial judgeship being a little bit pessimistic about, about jurors. But I came out of that very, very differently. I really think they want to get it right. They want to do a good job. But it's, it's easier for them not to get it wrong, I'll put it that way. If they're aware of all the things going on inside of them and all of the, the boogeymen they're playing in their, in their brains. So I'll give a quick example of a study that was done actually here in Philadelphia by Professor Baldus, who's, who's famous for a study that came up in a uh, famous, I should say infamous, Supreme Court case, McCluskey versus Kemp, that I don't want to go into because I didn't have my blood pressure medicine this morning. <laughs> Um, but what he did was he took, uh, he went to Philadelphia prison records and he took photographs of everybody within his sample who had been convicted of first degree murder and was death eligible. Not everybody convicted of first degree murder is thereby eligible to the death penalty. There have to be some additional factors brought in. There's a separate hearing. 
He, he took pictures of everybody who was death eligible within his sample. He then had a group of students grade them for uh, Afrocentric features based upon skin color, breadth of nose, hair texture, size of lips, those kinds of things. The kinds you would normally associate with someone, which would more normally suggest someone is of African heritage, as opposed to someone who would be associated with white heritage, lighter, straighter hair, uh, nose not as broad, and he graded them. He found there was a distinct correlation between the people who were death eligible who got the death penalty and the extent to which they graded low on the, af on the ethnic uh, scale. That is, their characteristics were identified as being more like uh, Europeans than like Africans. And the converse was true, that to the extent that someone had more characteristic blacker features, they had a demonstrably and statistically greater significance uh, chance of getting the death penalty. And he controlled for um, the number of aggravating factors, which are the kinds of things which get you the death penalty if you're convicted of, gets you to do a death penalty consideration. He controlled for mitigating circumstances. He controlled for everything that he thought that he could possibly control of. And still he found this correlation. Now, the correlation only occurred, and I always get this wrong, and I, I will, um, and, and Bernice may know the study also, and I'll let her correct me if I'm wrong. The correlation only showed up when the victim's race was either white or black. I'm not sure which, but I think it was only when the victim was, um, uh, was white. And it may well be that in that case, it doesn't really matter how black or how light you look. You're going, either going to get the death penalty or you're not going to get the death penalty. Whereas if the person you're killing is black, it just may not matter as much. And that's total speculation. He didn't get into that. That's not something I'm putting on it. But it, it's significant, I think, because it shows that um, whatever correlation, whatever controls were in place, if it didn't show up when a race of certain victims was there, but did show up another place, it would certainly suggest that the controls had some effect and that the correlation there, not suggesting causation, but there's a strong correlation, and you can argue that when correlation gets to be a certain, the closer they get statistically, the closer the correlation gets to one, that you're now talking about causation and not correlation. So clearly, there are other things going on in the room. But anyhow, that is a long, and I think those jurors were probably trying to be very, very fair. I don't think they're aware of what was going on in their minds. I think you see the same thing play out at sentencing, even under the sentencing guidelines. Judges try to be very, very fair. There's a judge that I'm aware of that, that Judge Donald knows in Iowa who will try not to sentence someone, he'll, and he'll get in his own mind an idea of what that sentence should be, uh, striking out all references to the person's race. This is obviously not in a trial, this is in a guilty plea context. So before he goes into the courtroom, he will not know what the race of the defendant's going to be. I don't know how you do that, because in Philadelphia, the residence is going to give you that. Um, but he, try, said he, just, he said he tries to go into the courtroom unaware of what the race of that defendant's going to be, have a sentence in his mind, and then try not to let the viewing of the defendant sway him from that. We all, excuse me, we all do it. And some of it is who we identify with, who we're afraid of. Um, and I think the only way we can fight against that is to recognize that it's there, not be threatened by the fact that it's there, not be defensive by the fact that it's there. I have it, we all have it. Be honest about it, and then try to see what we can do to deal with it. I think the shooter's bias, I think it's a, it explains why we're seeing so many incidents of, of black kids being shot unarmed. And there are, the, the social science on that is a legion uh, to document something called the shooter's bias. And um, police officers, I don't think, want to do that. But it's something that's been grained and in, drilled, drilled into us since the day we're born. Fascinating. Um, here's an interesting, tough question, Judge Brown. Uh, Wait, you said tough question, <laughs> Judge Brown. <laughs> well, I, I, you, can all, you, can all, you can all answer it. You can, and, I, and it's not addressed specifically to you, but I'm, I'm going to give it to you because you're okay. sitting right next to me. And it's your turn also. Uh, with your life's experience, how do you maintain empathy for jurists who construe the 14th Amendment narrowly? Well, uh, I think it goes to, uh, you know, it, it, it actually uh, follows what we have been talking about, and that is uh, the fact that we uh, all have biases. Um, one of my favorite little stories about this is uh, um, there's a story that someone told me about uh, two young fish who are swimming along, and a, an older fish swims by going the other way, and he says, 
howdy, boys, how's the water? And they swim on past, and the younger fish looks at the other one and says, what the heck is water? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we are. I mean, in reality, we all live in our culture. We, you know, we grow up in a certain way. Um, and it's so natural to us. Uh, it's just the way we see life. And so we don't have a sense that there's anything about that. It's also true that we are tribal by nature. We like our tribe best. We feel more comfortable with them. That's, you know, that's how things work. And so the only thing we can do um, is be aware of that. Uh, you know, be aware that that's part of uh, our nature. It's part of the way the world works. And then um, try to understand um, while we're doing that. And there's a lot of literature on how judges um, try not to let their biases interfere when they are making decisions. And one way says, well, you, you, you're, like, you're supposed to be like a runner stripped for the race. You kind of take everything off, and then you plunge into this. Um, I don't think that's very realistic. I think you simply have to know who you are, know what your biases are. And when you approach whatever you're doing, you consciously set that aside <laughs> you know, and then work to get the right answer. You know, that's, that's what you're trying to do. You can never be not a human being. Um, I, I don't think it's realistic to expect that. So I have empathy for judges who um, see things quite differently than I do, because I understand you know, that, like me, they're coming from a very different place. One of the great things I have always thought about um, having many different uh, kinds of people on the bench particularly when you're in appellate court and you work in panels, um, is that you actually begin to have that sense of it's not just one judge. It becomes uh, you know, a concert, not a solo. <laughs> and all of those different perspectives are working together toward a, you know, towards solving this problem. And so the people that you're working with actually do get to know uh, your story, and you get to know theirs. Um, and I think that's part of what makes this work. Have you changed your colleagues' mind, and have they changed yours? I think I have. I mean, I think there have been times when um, they, just because it, they don't see things in a particular way, um, and if you just say to them, but if you've ever had this experience, or you know, I can tell you without l looking any further, if I see a certain set of facts, I can tell you that the person who was stopped was black, for instance, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can tell you that certain things are happening. And so, um, and, and in the same way, they have experiences that I haven't had. So there are times when they say, but what you're not seeing you know, is X. So um, I, I think we all have that experience. Uh, just one or two more uh, questions. Judge Donald, uh, a questioner asks, since race is such a divisive issue, why do we insist on the artificial construct of race, pbs.org, race says there's no genetic basis for race. We're all one race, the human race. Why not dismantle this artificial foundation and substitute <coughs> ethnic group instead of race? You know, I think, that's, I think that would be um, noble and wonderful, but I think given where we are and given our history, uh, race, the artificial construct, would always be with us. We define so many things based on that. And, and so in terms of why don't we, we get rid of it, I think we're just so invested in this notion mm -hmm. of race. There are attributes that flow from race. Uh, Judge McKee mentioned some of the studies. Patricia Devine uh, has done a whole uh, research thing on, on privilege and, and who gets it. You know, we, we talk about, um, and we're talking here about the 14th Amendment, so we cannot discard all of the things of the past where things were defined uh, on that and continue to be today. I mean, I, I grew up in an era when I graduated high school where there were still visible signs that said white only. We have progressed, elevated, attributed things um, based on that status. And how do we dismantle that? I think it would be wonderful. But I think we're not in a colorblind society. I think that so many things are still going to be determined uh, by that. 
And we will continue to have to negotiate this issue, I think, for the foreseeable future. And I, I, I would love to know how we get, how we unpack that and how we get beyond that. Uh, but I don't sit on the, on the rise. Trains left the station already. It is <laughs> uh, damn near at uh, its destination. It's just too late. It's just yeah. way, way too late to, right. to turn back the clock. But I, I wanted to say one other thing. I agree with Judge Rogers on her last answer. And I say that I, I believe that judges, uh, all judges, come to the law, to the issues that they face from a position, a principal position and a position of good faith. People may differ, have different interpretations, and as I said, we all look at things through a lens that is impure, but I think people come to it uh, trying to get to the right answer, the right resolution. Uh, and I think we have to, as judges, respect difference. We have to try to ne ne negotiate reason, and then when we come to a decision, respect that everybody came to it bringing the best they had, with open minds and trying to apply the law uh, as they see that it should be applied. And sometimes you're in the majority and sometimes you're in the minority, but you live with it and you move. Beautiful, Judge, last word to you. Well, I just, uh, ordinarily on any panel, I am the most pessimistic person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so I find myself in the odd position of saying, well, you know, I, I think I heard both of my colleagues say, that's just, you know, it's just there, it's in, you know, it's intractable, it's never going to be any different. Um, and so I would like to just offer perhaps a, a little bit of a different sense of that. Um, and one of the things, I um, was born in Alabama, I spent my uh, young life there. Um, I left Alabama and I used to say I, it was a good place to be from. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have gone back there more recently um, to uh, lecture and to give speeches in schools which I could not have attended when I was younger. I would not have been allowed to go to those schools. But one of the interesting things that happens when I do that is I often relate some of my history and some of the things that I went through. And I'm talking to 20-somethings. And they are looking at me as if I came from Mars. <laughs> you know, they really don't, you know, this history means nothing to them. They don't think that way. They can't imagine it. They're sort of amazed, you know? Did those things really happen? So that says to me that things are different. The other thing that's happening is um, uh, I see, and some people may be offended by this and may, you know, not like this idea, but I see uh, many times people with their grandchildren and so forth, and those grandchildren are, you know, obviously of all kinds of different races. And you know what? Those people are treating them like they're their grandkids, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I see that. And so uh, whatever is happening here, and America demonstrates this probably more than, than any place else, but there are things that we, you and I, experience. Uh, that younger generations know nothing about. They don't think about it. It's not part of their consciousness. It's not what they're into. Um, and so I don't think it's quite perhaps as dire as it may seem. Now, I, I grant you that what's going on with multiculturalism and the sort of balkanization of the country now is very distressing and very disturbing. Um, and I hope that is not devolution. <laughs> I mean, I hope we're not moving back from something when we, when we were seeing a way forward. But so I just wanted to say, I, I, I actually on this subject, I don't feel quite as pessimistic. <laughs> well, I think I'm it's delighted that you ended on a note of optimism. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our wonderful judges. <laughs> it's